Good evening again. My name is Ashley Park. I'm the district counselor at Glendale Unified. We are so excited and pleased to see you here all tonight. Thank you so much for spending your Wednesday evening with us where you could be doing many, many different things. Uh, tonight is part two of our seven part series, Partnership with College Wise. Um, and before we begin, I just want to uh, give a shout out to our district leadership, Dr. Watson, Dr. King, uh, Dr. Coulter, Dr. Bailey, we also have in the audience, for seeing the vision and the mission of providing college admissions uh, information, up-to-date information to our families district-wide. Uh, before we begin tonight, uh, every uh, person walking into uh, the auditorium received a flyer. I just have to do a shameless plug. Uh, this is a college fair that is hosted by WACAC. It's the Western Association for College Admissions Counseling. They only host a limited number of college fairs uh, per year, uh, specifically in Southern California region. The next one is coming up next Saturday, April 6th. And it's not just a college fair where you interact with over 100 college reps, but they do have 12 different distinct workshops on uh, different college admissions topics. So please mark your calendars. It's free of charge. It's open to all families and other county residents. Uh, and I encourage you to attend. For tonight, uh, we have our wonderful uh, Christopher Logan and Kate Strzelewski from College Wise. Uh, their credentials are just long and long, uh, but I just have to highlight that uh, Kate is a former NYU admissions reader, um, and Christopher Logan is the director of DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at College Wise. He's a master counselor and also a two time recipient of the Yale Vice uh, Fellowship. Uh, but tonight, they will be talking about pursuing arts athletics and music and more uh, in college and so we're so delighted to have you here today before we begin if you can take out your phone and uh, with your camera click on the qr code that is a free survey uh, before the presentation begins uh, we really value your feedback we're trying to um, get better right uh, with every presentation and projects and events that we host so we welcome your feedback and any questions you have please um, enter it on the survey there's a pre-survey and also a post-survey at the end of this presentation we will have uh, the last 10 to 15 minutes for q a so if you can hold your questions for the end of the presentation that will be greatly appreciated thank you Hello everyone, I'm Christopher. Um, oh, I should grab a little remote thingy. Um, so just a quick introduction of who CollegeWise is. We are the largest educational consulting firm in the country. We are the official partner of the Common App itself. So every year we publish the Common App's actual guide to the Common App. Uh, we are also the college counseling arm of Michelle Obama's Retire Initiative. And we present at NACAC, we present at WACAC. So we are the biggest group of nerds like us who, do, who focus on college admissions and counseling in the country. Um, we have been around since the late 1900s, as I've heard people say it now. Um, we've helped thousands of students. We help students of every type. So last time I was here talking about great kids without great GPAs. Today we're talking about the arts and athletics. Next time I'm here, I'll be talking about highly selective admissions. We work with every type of student. We help students get into great schools. We help students get great scholarships. So that's the quick and dirty of who CollegeWise is. I'm not gonna go too much into that because I'm not a salesperson and also we have a very long presentation. All right, cool. Um, quick rundown of the agenda. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different levels of sports and athletics and admissions. Um, so for sports, it'll be D1, D2, D3. For arts, it'll be a little, I said sports and athletics, didn't I? Um, <laughs> sports and the arts. Um, for the arts, I'll be talking about art schools, schools with great art programs, schools, universities that have an art school or a conservatory, and also talking about the different levels of <clears throat> using the arts in the admissions process, as well as, 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 well as using athletics in the admissions process. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the reality of what sports and the arts look like on campus for how you pursue them. Um, 
we'll be going into some information about financial aid and scholarships tied to both of those. So how you can get scholarships for athletics, how you can apply for extra scholarships for the arts, even if you're not studying the arts at the university. Um, give some advice on how to build your list with your interests in mind and with your skills and talents in mind, taking into account that when you build lists as a student athlete or a student artist, it's also about building a list, not just about where you could pursue that interest on campus, but also about how you can strategize and use that interest or that talent to help you get into a great school. Um, we'll give some straightforward tips on like, this is how to go about it. And then, oh yeah, we'll go over athletes and artists for like a few tips. And then we'll be talking about Q and A. First off, I wanna talk about the levels of athletics on campus. I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly so that if there is more, if there are more specific details you want, we can talk about that at the end. But by and large, it's D1, D2, D3. And those are the main different levels for athletics in college. They, it's important to remember that D1 does, it, it doesn't just mean that they're really, really, really great at the sports. As my alma mater at Yale is a D1 sports school. We're not great at most sports. It's because we only play against the other members of the Ivy League. We're a weird little cabal of eight groups of nerds who are bad at sports. So we play together as D1. Um, but D1 schools are the ones that do the most recruiting. And so that's one of the most important things to think about when you think about the levels of athletics on campus. D1, those are the schools that do heavy recruiting. D1 schools are the schools where the coaches have the most latitude in how much they can support a student for getting into college. I typically talk to my student athletes in terms of like points. I say that like each, co each coach has a number of points they're allowed to spend on recruiting for their team. And the, like, the more attractive a student is to the admissions office, the fewer points a coach has to spend to help that student get in. The less attractive the kid is to the admissions office, the more points the coach has to spend. So the less attractive you are to the admissions office, the better you have to be at that sport <laughs> in order for the coach to be willing to spend those points on you. Um, and so there's the balance there, but D1 schools, heavy recruiting, those are the ones where the coaches generally have the most points especially if it's one of the sports that that school is very, very good at, if that's one of the sports that brings them in money. That's one of the other things to keep in mind. D1 schools are the schools where the sports bring them a lot of money, by and large, especially the ones that they're good at. D2 kind of falls into the middle. Oh, D1 is also where most of the, I, the reason I mentioned the money is that D1 schools are where most of the athletic scholarship money comes into play. D2 schools, there's some recruiting that happens. Like, it truly is kind of like the middle child of the athletics. There's some recruiting that happens. Coaches can support. They can defend a student. They're not usually doing as big of a pull in those areas. D2 schools typically are a slightly lower caliber of competition in terms of the sport. So some students who don't have what it takes to play at the D1 level might be looking at D2 schools if you're looking for recruitment. D2 schools are often schools where I, if I have a student who loves their sport, really, really wants to pursue their sport in college and whether or not they can pursue their sport in college is an important part of what's gonna go onto their list. We often look at D2 schools because they know that they can't really, they can't, pursue recruitment at that school, but it's a school where they might actually be able to play. Because some students can't, I mean, some students can't play at any school. I can't, I can't play soccer anywhere. But um, for students who really want to play their sport, but can't quite, if you want to play football, but you don't have what it takes to play football at University of Oregon, looking at a D2 school. Oregon's pretty good at almost every sport, I think. But D2 schools are often a great place for kids who love their sport, who are great at their sport, but who aren't D1 athletes put it simply. And then D3 schools are schools that play sports. <laughs> um, there is almost no recruiting that goes on at D3 schools. There are almost no scholarships that happen at D3 schools, but they're great for kids who want to play a sport who aren't necessarily like, if you're not first string on your club team or if you're not first string on the varsity team, you might do great at a D3 school. D3 schools are the ones that where like being a student athlete is not going to be, it's often not like a defining part of your entire college life because those athletic departments often don't, they don't push as much, they don't take up as much of the resources of the university. D3 schools do often have the, the least access to the university resources. 
not to say that like not to say that you're not going to get great training that you're not going to be able to play that you're not going to have a great time as a student athlete just like when you see the when you see the reports about how the coach of the LSU football team is the highest paid government employee in the state of Louisiana that's the reality at a D1 school i don't know if that's true in, in Louisiana but it is true in Alabama um, i'm going to say Alabama at first i just mix up the southern states they're all the same thing to me but um that's the case at a D1 school. That's not the case at a D3 school. D3 schools usually don't have that much access to the university resources. All right. Uh, the different levels of the arts in schools. So the first thing is there are some dual, there are dual degree programs. So you can see SMFA with Tufts Tiny in the corner at the top. So that's actually a dual degree program where you go to Tufts and you also you get a degree from Tufts and you get a degree from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Tufts has that, Brown has that, so Brown has a dual degree program with RISD. You get accepted to both Brown and RISD. You, you prioritize Brown, generally, because you are a full-time student at Brown, and you also take arts classes at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. It's down College Hill. It's literally called College Hill. Um, and you get a degree from both Brown University and RISD. Carnegie Mellon has a dual degree program with the something music school that starts with the letter S, but I just forgot the name. But dual degree programs are programs where you get two degrees. You get a, a regular, degular college degree, a BA or a BS or a B engineering or a B architecture, whatever have you. You get a, a regular, degular college degree and you also get typically a BFA, a Bachelor's of Fine Arts. You get an arts degree as well and you get them from two institutions. Some schools will actually let you do it both the dual degree program at one institution. Northwestern has a lot of these dual degree programs where you can go to the Northwestern School of Communications, which is where they put most of their arts programs, and also the Northwestern School of Engineering. And so you can get double degree from those as well. That's one level. Then there are full-on conservatories that are, at reg that are at conventional universities. And so I think the one I have on here is Oberlin. So Oberlin is famously the only college in the country with a full conservatory for undergraduates. So Oberlin is a standard conventional college. You can get a bachelor's degree in history, chemistry, computer science, what have you. But Oberlin also has a full conservatory for undergraduate BFAs. Then there are universities that have a school of the arts or schools of the arts at the university. That's USC. Um, so USC has, weirdly, just so you know, no one applies to USC. It is impossible to apply generically to USC. You must apply to the USC Dornsife College of Arts and Sciences, the USC Marshall School of Business, the USC Kaufman School of Dance, or the USC SCA School of Cinematic Arts. USC is the, an example of a college that is a university that is broken up into constituent undergraduate colleges some of which are schools of the fine arts or of the performing arts. So there's the School of Drama, there's the uh, Kaufman School of Dance, there's the Thornton School of Music. Um, that's USC. That's an example of a university that just has schools of the arts. UCLA is the same way. Um, UMICH is the same way. And then there are just some colleges that have the arts as a major. So there's, there's no separate school of the arts. There's no separate conservatory. They say, come on down. You can study the arts. Just, it's, it's, it's a major next to the other majors. I have the entire Ivy League shoved into the corner because I don't like seven of them. Um, and all of those are the same. You come, you study an art. If you change your mind, click the button, change your major. I had an existential crisis one sophomore year, and I changed my major seven times. I ended where I started, in case anyone was wondering. And that's why I have a degree in math. Um, <laughs> But all of the Ivies are examples of schools where you just study the arts. You don't, you don't have to apply separately. There's no special thing. It's just alongside all the other majors. And it says in big font, this is the end of Christopher's section. <laughs> Thank you. I love how Christopher ended that. He <laughs> ended where he started. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you guys today, and I'm going to take over at the reality of this. This is one part of our job that is 
the responsible part that the parents don't always want to do, but that's why we're here, okay? We kind of talk about the, what's the reality of this? What does this really look like for your student? Um, and sometimes it's easier to have this, have a third party, right, talked with you about this conversation. So this is the reality of college athletics. So let's really look at these and just glance at these numbers for a second if I think they're big enough on the screen. Eight million, eight million students play athletics every year for high school students. That's a lot of students all across the country. So you are one of many if you are in a high school sport, JV, varsity, so fun. I think there's so many great lessons to be learned in athletics. I played in high school as well. And then you look to the step further. What is the next step after this? More than, you have 480,000 compete as NCAA athletes. All right, so this is division one, division two, II, division three. So that's a lot smaller than eight million. All right, I'm not good at math. I was not a math major, Christopher, and I know <laughs> 480,000 is a lot smaller than 8 million. So that percentage of just the odds of going to college and just wanting to play, a lot of kids um, might be burned out. A lot of students want to focus on something else. If this is part of your journey, just know you're one of a few. Um, but also, there is a path for you. And we're going to kind of offer all those different paths, all these different divisions. You can, can look at these other numbers. And these, of course, are the athletes we see on TV, we see in the Olympics. but. You can see only 2% of high school athletes earn athletic scholarships. So that's kind of that next step, right? Okay, I wanna play in college, but now the, the odds of this and odds of actually get, you know, we, we, we see youth sports. I have little kids and you see these parents that, right, the goal is to get this athletic scholarship and they're eight, you know? All right, 2%. So, the reality of this, if your student you think has potential to be a part of these athletic scholarships, this is awesome. We're gonna talk about this more and what some of these scholarships look like. Um, but again, something that you can't exactly have your heart dependent on. We are gonna skip forward to arts. Is arts a reality? And this is where Christopher mentioned before, this can be a reality in a lot of different ways. Um, this can be a reality you don't have to major in an art. So you might just be interested in dancing on the dance team at school, you can do that. You might just wanna continue your art classes that you took in high, in, in high school. Continue and take those. You have electives in college. There are places for you to go. So there's a lot of different ideas. We have students that they are, they go and they major in dance. They go and major in studio art. There are schools for you that have those programs. One of the big parts of um, studying the arts in college is portfolios. So those portfolios are a big part of what Christopher and I do when we're working with students at CollegeWise, is we're preparing them for what those portfolios look like and making sure they're just prepared ahead of time. A lot of it is organizing, building timelines. Um, every school has different requirements for portfolios, so there's not kind of one general system that would make it way too easy for us. Um, they make this very complicated. So some schools just ask for one or two things for a portfolio, where other schools, they want you to write something. They want a video. They want some pictures. They want, um, you might even need to do an audition or an interview. So there's lots of different steps. So really researching the exact website for your art program is very important and going directly to that school resource. We're back to sports. We're flipping around a little bit. So NCAA schools and tools. I'm going to add an S to that tool. Um, this is a great place to start. So if you are interested in playing um, NCAA, regardless of division, and you want to take a look at your choices, there's a search tool. It's NCAA.org. Um, and you can search different divisions. So depending on what your coaches are sharing might be where you might fall. Is it division one? Is it more likely division two? 
you can actually put that in. Okay, I want to see all Division II schools that have, so that have you know, men's soccer teams that are in this area of the country. You can sort that on this website. So it's a great tool, especially if you're open to different areas of the country. Um, you want to just see what's out there. This is a great place for you to start. I want you to also take a look at this map for a second. I am an East Coaster, and Christopher went to school on the East Coast, so we're a little different. Um, but we have, um, of course, we both now live here on the West Coast. And if you can look at the map, a lot of these schools are on the East Coast. So the other thing that we work with a lot of our West Coast students with is are you focused on staying on the West Coast? Are you open if you truly love your sport, truly love an art? Are you open to some of these phenomenal schools and programs that are just happen to be on the other side of the country? Um, so I encourage you as parents as well to have an open mind for your student. We work really hard at College Wise to make a balanced college list. Um, have you know, I like my students to have schools in state, out of state, private schools, public schools, so they have a lot of options at the end of this. All right, we're going to stay on sports, at least we're, we're staying on the same track. It's, except I'm going to call this um, student athletes and student artists. They, this can actually be used for both. So when you go through the one, two, and three steps, think of this as something you can do regardless of whether you're an artist or an athlete. The first thing I'm gonna point out is it, it does say student athlete, right? We never see athlete student, we never see artist student. There's a reason for that. When you're going to college, you are primarily that student then th this skill or this interest is second. Your athletics is second and also your art, your art is second. First one, remember there's requirements for some of these things. So this is specifically for sports, but as an NCAA athlete, you need to have a minimum 2.3 GPA in high school. And then once you get to college, there's gonna be requirements as well. And those are different for division one, division two, II, and division three. But you will have different requirements. You have to take so many credits per semester. You also have to take so many credits within your first few semesters or first two years of college. So you do have to keep a certain GPA and take so many semester hours to be eligible to play in the NCAA. So just remember, just because you got into college, you might have gotten into that and, um, sports team that you wanted to, you still need to keep up those grades and you are a student first. Second, interests change. Um, so remember, Christopher and I work with some students starting freshman, sophomore year of high school. And I always tell my students, I love what you know, what's your interest now? What major do you think you might be? And for a lot of students, by the time I end with them senior year and they're off to college, they've changed. And of course, growing from 15, 16, 17 years old, there's a lot of transition that goes on. So I encourage you too to be open with that understanding that you might love a certain sport or think this is what you want to do when you're a sophomore. By the time you're a senior, it might not be your end all and be all, but their college journey Getting that degree, going there, experiencing that independence, that's going to stay. So your interest may change, that art, that sport. Kind of focus on that solidarity of just that academic world that you're going to live in and that environment of college and what that looks like. The third one is sports only go so far. Um, not every student is going to be a professional athlete. Not every, not every artist is going to have a piece in a museum. So just be aware, kind of be honest with yourself. This is a little bit of, a, again, a reality check that we work with families and students with of, you know, what is the goal? I talk to my students all the time. Let's, you might be doing something every day, putting hours of practice in, but what is that goal? What does that look like? Is the goal to play in college? Is the goal to play after college? Is the goal just to be a great teammate and really support your school? That's a great goal too. This is where my section ends. But I have one more, one more slide before we do that. 
For those of you interested in these sports and what this looks like when you get there, Division I, Division II, and Division Three are up here on the board. And you can see that we've separated out to how many hours you're gonna spend playing that sport a week, how many hours you're gonna be doing academics. And I want you to take a look at that. I even ask my students now when we're working together that are athletes, you know, how many hours, you know, you're in school for eight hours a day, six hours a day, you play your sport for two or three during the season, how many hours do you have for homework, when do you sleep and eat, I don't really know. So we try to map out what that day looks like, but also think about all that time you're giving during your college career to this sport, to your academics. And make sure there's a, there's a balance of what can come first, what can come second, and is this something that you can sustain. The goal is actually the friends we made along the way. Um, but um, quick note for essentially how to go about trying to go to a school to play a sport. Um, it, it's one opportunity to limitless possibilities. The NCAA kind of owns college sports in America. It's like, um, I was gonna say this, the soccer thing in Europe and then I forgot what it's called, FIFA, there we go. Um, it's, I'm so good at this. Um, but the NCAA eligibility, um, your eligibility profile, it, this is step one. It's the most important step. It's the step that if you don't do it, you're not gonna play a sport in college because they are all required to go through this. So step one is your NCAA eligibility profile. You may hear about something called the NCSA, which is something else, and it has letters that stand for something else that I don't remember because I typically tell my students not to do it. Um, it, it it's not a bad thing, it's just typically if they're, working with, if they're working with somebody, they don't need that extra support. But the NCSA is another, it, it helps you put together your athletic profile. The NCAA eligibility profile is a mandatory profile for somebody hoping to do college athletics hoping to go through the recruitment process. It's where the coaches find you, it, it's where your information lives, you put your test scores and things on there, your GPA, your test scores, everything. That's where the coaches come, that's where they find you. You can also do things like the, the recruitment questionnaires on individual colleges' websites. I highly recommend those. It's a great way to put your information directly in front of not the head coach, but the assistant coach who does all the reading and then tells the head coach which kids they care about. But the, those questionnaires are great. But even on those questionnaires, they will ask you for your NCAA eligibility profile. If you want to play a sport in college, this is step zero. You cannot take steps without this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how to build your list, both for athletics and for the arts. So I'll bounce back and forth between the two. For building your list for athletes, I, for students, especially if you're trying to go D1, if you're really trying to prioritize recruitment, I actually kind of tell students, the coaches tell you whether or not schools go on your list. If you are trying to do recruitment, you should, be, you should have your NCAA um, eligibility profile, you should be going through Clearinghouse, you should be filling out those questionnaires, and the schools from which you get responses from the coaches, the schools that are showing interest in you, those are the schools that should start to populate your list. Because if you're trying to go through recruitment and the coaches aren't in communication with you, the coaches are showing you that they are not interested in you. And now I will say, if you are okay with potentially not playing your sport at that school, keep it on the list, as long as the other things check out. But if it's a school that you were hoping to use recruitment for and the coaches are not responding to you, that is a school where recruitment isn't working. So I do say to athletes who are trying to use that, the coach responses tell you what schools go on your list. Fill out the recruiting questionnaires. That's how you get the coaches to respond to you. That's how you get their informa your information in front of them. They're actually, once you start filling them out, they kind of do, they kind of start to like pre-populate themselves because some of you may have already heard about the, um, the net price calculator that schools have. That's like one, it, it's actually like the back end is that it's one system that just gets different front-end development for different school branding, but it's one database where once your information's in there, it can just repopulate for you. 
Lots of those questionnaires are also done through the same thing. So once you've done it once, it gets easier to do at most places. Some places are really annoying, MIT, and they have their own backend developers and have never met a front-end developer in their life. And so you will have to start from scratch when you get there. But many of them do actually just like re-pull your information so they get easier. Um, go to prospect, like, number three is just be in front of coaches, be in front of recruiters. They need to find out that you're good at your sport so that they can recruit you for their sport. If you play tennis, if you can make it to IMG in Florida, go to IMG in Florida. Read Atlas Shrugged, that man loved tennis. Uh, but you need to put yourself somewhere where coaches at the schools can recruit you. Go to training camps. You have to put in that work to be visible because they're not searching for the, like they're, they're searching for a diamond in the rough, but they're not searching like they're not lifting up the corners, they're not digging under anything. They have to look across the entire country, and she's a big one, to find the best kids. So they are going to the places where they can get maximum visibility on as many people as possible. Number four is like, so talk to colleges about your ability to play, see if they're going to be, it's, this is the beginning of like the be honest, and this is, I think talk to colleges, but also talk to your coaches. And this gets to what Kate and I were talking about with like the, the reality of sports. It's there are 8 million kids who play, there are 480,000 who make it to, like 800 high school level, 480,000 who make it. That's, eight, that's roughly 6%. And only 2% of those kids get scholarships. So that's a very small percentage. Be very honest with your coaches. Ideally, they will tell you the honest truth about whether or not you have what it takes to be D1 or D2 or D3 so that you're not spinning your wheels. And then talk to colleges about, okay, do I have what it takes? I, I, I have students who have pursued UC Berkeley without the transcript that makes it anywhere near reasonable that they would be pursuing UC Berkeley. And baby girl is at Berkeley running right now. She's probably on a track because the coaches were very clear with her. You are the fastest little girl we've ever met. And so that's how we knew that Berkeley was going to be a reality for her. Oregon, on the other hand, said, we've met faster. And so like, or this was a student for whom Berkeley was a reality and University of Oregon was not. Both great schools, but in a vacuum, you would expect the opposite, but it's because she was speaking directly to the coaches. And when it gets to those points, University of Oregon has a lot of points to spend on a kid, but they are one of the best athletic de departments in the country. And so they spend their points very differently from how Berkeley does. And then build a college list that meets your academic and sports needs. You want, if you want to play, put schools where you can play on your list. But also make sure that, again, as Kate said, your student athletes, if you want to go pre-med, put schools that can help you with pre-med on your list. If you want to major in architecture, go to a school with an architecture program. They're very limited. Make sure that you are taking care of both sides of this because not everyone makes it pro, so take care of both sides of it. Um, and then contact schools early. Uh, start talking to them sooner rather than later because coach, once coaches latch onto the kids that they're latching onto, they set in their claws and they're not, you, they're not easily distracted unless you are, like unless you, if, if you are to your sport what Serena Williams is to tennis, yes, they will get distracted. But if that is not you, you need to start early because they will not, they are, they're not likely to get distracted once they get started for the arts. Step one is decide what level of the arts you want to pursue. Um, this is one where the student artist does actually maybe make a slight change because depending on the level of arts you pursue, you may be an, a student of the arts. So decide if you want to go to a conservatory, decide if you want to go to a school of the arts, or if you want to go to school and major or minor in the arts, or if you want to major in something else and be on the dance team and or just like submit things to the creative writing department or if you want to just be on the lit mag, which is totally fine. It's just decide on what that's going to be for you because that will affect how you go about things. Um, especially because if you want to be a student of the arts, you will probably be in the bucket where you have to submit a portfolio. Not everywhere has it, but some schools you have to. Um, review the portfolio requirements and prioritize what's actually possible. Being in California means that I can swing a dead cat and hit 15 kids who want to apply to the USC SCA, the School of Cinematic Arts, and they want, to go to, they want to go to SCA for the film production major, which has 
a terrifying portfolio requirement. You have to make, you, you have to have a certain number of scripts written, you have to have a certain number of films. The Chapman Dodge School of Film has a very specific two minute silent film requirement. You need to make sure that you look at the portfolios and you know what's required and what you are actually capable of producing. If you're, do, if you're going for dance, what are the combos? Do they require you to do tap? Have you never done tap in your life? You need to make sure that you are actually going to be able to cut it with whatever their portfolio requirements are. Some architecture schools require that you have CAD experience. Some arts programs require you to submit things in three different mediums. Make sure that you know what the, what the portfolio requirements are. Make sure that you, you're able to get that done. I also say, look at the, um, review the audition requirements and prioritize the possible there. So if you're, going to, if you're going for dance, for acting, for drama, for music, one, some schools actually do require on-campus auditions, which is problematic. I think it's very weird that they require you to fly out there for them, but prioritize putting together a list where you can do whatever is required of the review process for their auditions. See if you can make it. See if, you're, like, see if there's going to be a conflict if, like, if the only day that you can audition for NYU Tisch is the day of your sister's wedding. Like, okay, see what's possible. Make sure you know so that you're not caught off guard by that down the line. Review the portfolio review process. <laughs> This is one of the unique things for the arts. Um, you saw on that slide earlier that some schools have mandatory portfolios for students applying for the arts. Some schools have optional portfolios for students applying for the arts or for anyone in general. And the, the optional portfolios are the ones that I say it's very important to review the review process. A mandatory portfolio is almost always reviewed by the relevant faculty for your department. If there's a mandatory portfolio for film, the film faculty is looking at it. If there's a mandatory audition for dance, the dance department is watching you kickball change. If there is an optional portfolio, it can go one of two ways. At many schools, the optional portfolios are reviewed by the admissions team, which means some regular schmo is like, I think that was a beautiful fuete. I don't know. She turned and she didn't fall. That's impressive to me. But if it's reviewed by the, admission, by, the, by the arts faculty, do you like the way I stuttered? If it's reviewed by the arts faculty, that means that a professor of your field is sitting there watching you like this, waiting for you to make a mistake. Or not. But you need to make sure you review that because Stanford is a great example just because we're in California and everyone thinks about Stanford. At Stanford, all arts portfolios are optional. So like, and they're, they're available for any student. So you can apply to Stanford as a mechanical engineering major and submit a dance portfolio or a music portfolio. They don't accept film portfolios or an arts portfolio or even a creative design portfolio. But at Stanford, if you submit that optional portfolio, it is reviewed by the relevant faculty, which means the admissions office is not the one taking a look at it. The faculty is looking and they are looking to see, are you of the caliber of the students in our department? And at a school like that, I say, do not submit that portfolio unless you actually are. Don't just say, I can sort of dance, I'll submit a dance portfolio. That will likely hurt your application. I say likely, it will. <laughs> if, like, if you do not have what it takes to submit a dance portfolio to the faculty, don't. But if you're applying to, Columbia just changed theirs. Um, oh, if you're applying to Yale. Um, Yale actually has the, we still do it. Yale still has the portfolios reviewed by the admissions team, which means John Yee and his team are like, John Yee is actually very good at dance. Sorry, John is a friend of mine who I went to school with and he's currently the director of admissions. But like John, he's a great dancer. He was on the dance team. But like his team is looking at your film portfolio. They're looking at your art portfolio. They are very well educated, but they are not arts professors. So it takes less to impress them. It's still Yale, they're still looking for great talent, but you get the point. Look to see, is this reviewed by the faculty or is it reviewed by the admissions office? If you go to the admissions website and look up blank school optional arts portfolio, it will say on the website who reviews it. Keep that in mind. If it's reviewed by the faculty, it, it's only the optional ones that are like this. Mandatory ones are all reviewed by the faculty, but if it's reviewed by the faculty, make sure you have what it takes. If it's reviewed by the admissions officers, like still make sure you have what it takes. Don't submit a dance portfolio of you falling all over the place, but it doesn't need to be as extreme. 
and then build a list that meets your academic and artistic requirements. It's the same thing. Make sure that you can study the arts the way you want to study them. Make sure that you can participate the way you want to participate. Maybe your school doesn't have a dance major. Yale does not have a dance major. But Yale has one of the best undergraduate dance teams, at Yale Dancers, but it's contemporary and ballet. Um, some schools don't have film departments. Maybe that's not where you want to go. Some school, like maybe you can do something else related to film, but a lot of schools don't have film departments. Some schools have film departments, but they don't have screenwriting or they don't have directing. Look to make sure that they have whatever it is that you are looking for. I almost pushed the bad button. And then start working on your application materials early. I say this part because lots of schools do have those mandatory portfolios, especially if you're applying for the arts. And sometimes those portfolios are longer than the original application. USC is my favorite and least favorite example of this because if you're applying to the USC School of Cinematic Arts, that portfolio is twice as long as the core USC application. It's a nightmare. It's, it's great. USC is an amazing film school, but you need to be prepared for that. I don't know what their theater department application is like. I haven't done it in a very long time. The recruiting calendar. Luckily, artists, there's no recruiting calendar for you. This is sports only. <laughs> um, I'll give you a quick rundown of them, but I won't give you the specific timelines because oddly, the recruiting calendar is different for every sport. <laughs> um, but just know that there is, there's the contact period. That's the period where it actually becomes legally okay for coaches to reach out to you. There are some sports where coaches are banned from contacting you for like the first one, two, or even three years of your high school career. They are not allowed to talk to you. If they do, bad things happen. I don't actually know what happens. Um, but they're not allowed to. <laughs> Um, and, if you, and if you respond, like the bad thing is if you respond, you will violate NCAA eligibility and so then you become ineligible. So you look out for it because you don't want to accidentally make yourself ineligible. Um, then there's a quiet period where they're allowed to, they're only allowed to talk to you on campus. There's like a, like a little dead zone period. Then there's the evaluation period, which is where they're actually allowed to start, like they're actually allowed to start reviewing materials that you send them or that they find from you. Um, and they're allowed to visit, like they're actually allowed to show up to your school and watch. I mentioned those training camps and everything. Training camps they can go to because that's not at your school. They can go to those like at any point. At any point they can just be there because they can be watching anyone. You can be there. They can see it. But the evaluation period is the period where they're actually allowed to come to your school to watch you play. And then there's the dead period where they're not allowed to talk to you at all. No unofficial visits, no official visits, nothing at all, no communication. The bigger your sport, the more heavily regulated it is. If you play football or basketball, heavily regulated. If you ride horses, there's some rules. <laughs> We're gonna look at the money side of things. So we talked about this before with that 2% get scholarships. So we're gonna break scholarships down a little bit again for athletes, full ride. Okay, what does that actually mean? We throw that term around all the time. Um, so for parents, look at the fine print. This is everything. Tuition, this is fees, this is room and board, this is transportation. So it covers a lot of things. But obviously the percentage of students that receive that, extraordinarily small. Full tuition, it's a little bit more common, right? Tuition is paid for, all right? So that is, that is the cost of you attending the institution. And this is, um, and it's also, um, it covers some of those additional expenses on campus, all right? But everything else is on you, all right? So room and board's on you, um, books, all those other things, that's for you. So you have to make sure you include that. Transportation, again, those East Coast schools with all the sports that we talked about. And then you also have these other scholarships. We call them the equivalency scholarships. So up here you can see that these are based on the value, and this goes back to the points that Christopher was talking about earlier, where depending on the institution, the coach can say, I really want this student, I'm gonna invest this much money in getting this athlete, but at other institutions, and obviously as we all know, different institutions have a different pot to pull from, different sports have a different pot to pull from. So we have to be extraordinarily aware of what that looks like. How many spots are there on that team? 
What does that pot look like at that institution? Do we know that there's a lot of money at that school for that sport? Or do we know that this is a sport that we most likely will not receive that much in institutional aid? So just think about all those things as you go into this as an athlete of which pot, where do you think you're going to fall and being very realistic about that with that net price calculator that we mentioned before. You can see that tuition, you can see the room and board, the total, and what that looks like. We have an example up here with that equivalency scholarship that Christopher was talking about. And what this looks like is make sure you're really aware. So a student might say, hey, I got this wonderful scholarship. I got $10,000. Well, if just tuition is 50 and they got 10, you're still paying 40 in tuition plus room and board. That's still, a, that's still a good amount of money that you're paying for that institution versus is your total tuition maybe $13,000 and you get a $5,000 scholarship. That ends up being a very different number. So just make sure you're extraordinarily aware and calculating all of these costs as you look at these scholarships. I wanna talk really fast about artist scholarships too. So there are art scholarships out there. And depending on what program you're applying to at what schools, make sure that you actually do some research because those art scholarships aren't always as broadcasted as some of the other ones. You need to go to the school's scholarship page. Um, an example that we talk about a lot is Tulane Music has a, has a great scholarship for um, musicians. And, but it's not one that you're automatically applying for. You have to actually go to the website and apply for it. So these are kind of an extra step for artists. And that's also something that we can help you do is research some of those art scholarships. Hopping back to athletes, three tips. First one, so if there's any takeaways from today, we hope you learned a little bit about where to start, some of the websites you can go to, but also the first thing is stay on top of things. Um, please start organizing yourself. One of my favorites is a student of mine that came to me with a very interesting Gmail account um, email. And one of my first recommendations was, why don't we have a new email account for college applications and for college recruiting? And even those of you out there that have joesmith at gmail.com, let's maybe, maybe you want a joesmith79, that's your football number, and that's where all of your athletic recruitment information goes. Stay organized, okay? Any communication with coaches goes there. All of, you know, when you fill out your NCAA eligibility form, that all goes there. Stay organized early, it will help you. Um, make sure also in your organization you're writing down coaches' names, schools, how many players are on the team, how many seniors are gonna graduate that year when then you're gonna come in as a freshman. Is, is half the team gonna be gone? So they're gonna be ask, they are gonna be looking for a lot of, of athletes great things to write down just to note. Number two, again, just the honesty and be proactive. Just be really honest and talk with your coaches, talk with people that you really genuinely um, want to know their opinion on your athlete's performance and on your art. What does this look like and what do they think they could guess your future may be in that, in that either that sport or in that art. And number three, is remember that you're kind of a little mini business as an athlete and as an artist, but as an athlete specifically. Think about your social media. Think about things you put out there, right? TikTok. We have all of those different things that students do now. Just make sure that you're aware of what's out there and what's public information about yourself. Remember, people that don't know you, the first thing they may do is Google you, right? And what's gonna come up? So just as something to think about as a high school student in this tech age. Major tips for artists, very similar. I'll go through these quick, but first and foremost, stay on top of things like Christopher shared, especially with those portfolio requirements. Make sure you know what's requested of you. Number two, again, the honesty factor. Know where you're going to fall in that. Do you just want to take art classes at a school or do you really want to be an art major? I talk with this a lot with students. Um, is this something that you really want to major in and what are you going to do afterwards with that art versus 
is it a great minor for you? Are you going to be a business major and just have an awesome minor as, as, an, as art? And that's amazing and probably will help you a lot with your stress level too. Um, and again, you're, you're creative, like you are a creative. So make sure everything that you're putting out there is representative of you. You're proud of yourself. You make sure that it's areas that you want other people to see your art in certain you know, platforms. Um, all of these things will help you moving forward as long as you're, again, honest about it and are publishing things that you're really proud of. And then I'll just echo what Kate was saying about the, the socials and everything. For student athletes, during the, during the periods where coaches aren't necessarily allowed to make direct contact, they do often use social media to keep track of your progress and keep track of your performance. I actually have many of my student athletes create a second social media account for whatever platform they use that is basically just like their highlight reel where they put all that out there because it makes it visible. And I often then have them make their regular one private. Um, also, Kate mentioned like keep track of the seniors who are graduating and everything. One thing that happens, especially at D1 schools, is because those teams need to work together, the, the team captain and the seniors and or the juniors on that team typically get to review the prospects, the prospective students, and they, those are college age kids, they will typically go straight to social media to see if they think they and the team will get along with the kid. So the team, when they're researching prospects, is normally looking at your social media. So it actually does, for student athletes, you do need to be aware of your social media presence because even if the coaches don't find you, the kids roughly your age will. So take care of that. Um, how does college wise help? The short answer is a nerd like us can be, your, can, be an, like, can be a supplement to the college counseling that you're already getting, but we help with application strategies. We help with the one-on-one -on -one pairing of, let's build that list, let's make sure you have these profiles, let's make sure that you're building your overall profile, both as a student athlete, student artist, and in general. Um, we have AP, SAT, tutoring, and everything. I'm running through this quick so we can get to the Q&A. And then we have specific athletic guiding and specific arts guidance. So we can help with, we can actually help with helping develop your portfolio, figuring out which schools your portfolio will be best at, and doing that negotiation, that navigation of the conversations with coaches and building your profile and everything like that. And then it's Q&A time, and there's another QR code up here. So this is the Q&A time. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. 